French novelist and playwright, Alexander Dumas, once had a heated quarrel with a rising young politician. The argument became so intense that during that day, the only way to settle a conflict was with pistol duels. And so the two men came together, but because both of them were such excellent shots, they decided instead to draw lots. Here's how it worked. They'd have, whoever drew the lot, right, would then go off by themselves and they would shoot themselves instead of the two of them drawing pistols on each other. And so they drew lots and guess whose lot was drawn? Dumas's, Alexander Dumas's. So pistol in hand, right, he withdrew into a silent dignity, and, and, and he withdrew in silent silence to another room, right? He closed the door behind him, and the rest of the company waited in gloomy suspense for the shot that would end his career. It rang out at last. Boom! His friends ran to the door, opened it, found Dumas, smoking revolver still in his hands. And he spoke these words. Gentlemen, a most regrettable thing has happened. I missed. <laughs> so beyond the world of pistols drawn and clever escapes, we want to realize this morning that something is really missing. That something is missing from the lives of so many people, and especially followers of Jesus. And what is missing from the life of so many people is what we call the fruit of peace. What's missing from the lives of so many people that I talk to and interact and engage with is a life filled with peace. Just a moment ago, we sang this song, It Is Well With My Soul. But if I was to ask you personally, how many of you actually felt well in your soul? I think I would be surprised, I think it wouldn't surprise me to hear a lot of folks go, you know what, it's not really well with my soul right now. I'm not really at peace. In fact, yesterday I took an informal poll on social media and I had a simple question. I said, will you please tell me for just a moment how you would rate your level of peace right now? on a simple scale of one to five. One being this, all right? <laughs> peace, I don't know any peace. My life is chaotic, right? Or five, I'm like a ship and you can't sink me, right? It's well with my soul. And I ask people to rate their life right now. If you had this on a scale of one to five, your life of peace. And it was really interesting. Number one was this. Nobody gave themselves a five. I thought that was fascinating. Nobody could rate themselves right now in this moment of time and say, you know what, I'm a five. My life is so filled with peace that I'm a five. Now, I got, I got some fours and a few threes, but you know that the majority of people who took the poll said this, I'm a two and there were a whole lot of ones. That their life was just not very at, much at peace. Okay? And so, what, taking that, right, I realized something is missing from people's lives. And it's the gift of peace. How to have real peace in your life today. Not just in the future. Not just a pipe dream. But that you can have a life of peace right now. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to open up to the book of James, chapter 3. And we're going to hear James talk about our life of peace this morning. So let's pray. And then let's, uh, let's get after it this morning. So God, thank you so much for bringing us here together. Help remove the distractions of life for just a moment. Help us to focus our attention onto you. And help us to dive into this question, can I really have peace at life? Can I have peace when I'm at school? Can I have peace when I'm at work? Can I have peace in my home? Can I have peace with my friends and family? Can I have peace with the relationships of the people I'm in? Can I be at peace? Can I really experience real peace? And we all said together, amen. amen, amen. All right. When I was a teenager, 
One of the things that we always like to do with one another is we used to like to throw up these two fingers like this, right? And whenever we were going somewhere, we would say peace, or we'd go peace out, right? So, so everybody do that with me just this morning. Throw up two fingers. Go peace. Peace. Peace out. Peace out. All right. There we go. Now you guys are all cool like me, right? Okay. So, so here we go, right? We're going to talk about peace this morning, right? Peace is so much more than a symbol on a car, on a t-shirt, or two fingers put up in the air. So what is it? What is the fruit of peace? I want to start by saying this. Let's, for just a moment, look at the things that peace is not, okay? You don't have peace when these two things are going on, right? Number one. Peace is not avoiding problems. Can y'all say that with me? It's not avoiding problems, okay? Peace isn't sticking your head in the sand. Peace isn't ignoring some things and hope that it goes away. Peace isn't something wondering, will time make all things better? That's not peace, okay? Peace is not saying, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to dive into it. I don't want to deal with it. That's not peace. If you're avoiding a problem, then your life right now is probably not peaceful, okay? I once heard it said this, and this is a great image, right? Avoiding conflict is like having termites in your house. It means all the damage is being done and you don't even know it because you're avoiding it. All right? So peace is not what? Say it with me, church. It's what? Not avoiding conflict. Number two, it's not appeasing another person, right? It's not appeasing another person. That means if you're always giving in, your life will never be at peace. If you're always like just saying what needs to be said so you can end an argument, your life's not at peace. If you're like backing down from honest conversations so that you don't have to be in a conflict, your life will never be at peace. If you're allowing yourself to be manipulated or your boundaries pushed, your life is not at what? Church, say it with me. You're not at what? Peace. All right? Those are the two things that peace is not. So what is it? All right? Let me give you a definition. Peace comes from this beautiful word, shalom. It's an amazing Hebrew word, and it means to be whole. It means to be complete. It means to be proper. It means to be, have no division, no strife, no enmity, or discord in a relationship. How do you know you have shalom? It's real simple, okay? I call this the shalom test, all right? So, Haley, will you come up here and help me for just a moment, okay? All right? So, Haley's a good friend. Come here, Haley. All right? So, so, all right? This is Shalom. Shalom means that, that I could come up and give Haley a side hug and just say, hey, I love you. And there's nothing in what? There's nothing in between us, right? Okay? But let's say Haley goes home and says on social media after church, that was the worst sermon ever. not be so chill. <laughs> That's a good word for it, right? We ain't so chill anymore. There ain't no peace. There ain't no peace between us, right? So, so what happens? So something negative has just happened. Something is put in between us, and now there's what? Separation, okay? There's something in between us, right? So instead of having shalom, we ain't at peace, no shalom. right? There ain't no shalom, right? <laughs> How many of you know what that feels like, okay? You just know it. You walk into the room, you see a person, you know if you have shalom or if there ain't no shalom, right? You know it. Thank you, Haley. Y'all give it a Haley. Good job, Haley. All right? See, that's shalom, okay? See, shalom says there's no tension in the relationship. Shalom says there's no bitter feelings or ill will towards that person. Shalom says I'm not holding on to something. I'm not holding on to spite or hurt or anger towards another person. That is what, say with me, that's what? Shalom. And when you have shalom, you have what? Peace. And that's what God wants from us. Okay? The fruit of peace is a gift that the Holy Spirit helps me experience and you experience 
so that I can be at peace with God and peace with other people, right? That's what God wants. In fact, just to kind of let, lay it out here, right? Let's look for just a moment at God's word. We're going to see that the fruit of the peace is crucial. See, God does not want you to be a one or a two. God wants you to be a four or a five every day. Watch this. Number one, God wants you to experience peace. John chapter 16. I have said these things to you. This is Jesus talking. I've said these things to you that in me, you may have what? Say it with me, church. Peace. A relationship with Jesus brings peace to our lives. You're going to have tribulation in the world, but don't you worry, Jesus says, I've overcome the world. Number two, God wants peace to dominate your life. He wants peace to dominate your life. Check this out. Colossians chapter 3 verse 15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule your heart. God wants your heart to be covered in what? Peace. What's what he says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. He says, the peace of God, which goes beyond your understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. What does God want to rule both your mind and your heart? Say it with me, church. Peace. God wants you to be at peace, and he wants peace to guard what's going on in here and in here. Heart and mind. And then finally... Watch this. God wants you to live at peace with one another, right? He says this in Romans 12, 18. If possible, so far that it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, strive for peace with, now check this out, everyone. Not just the people you like. Not just the people you're around, but who do we strive to be at peace with? Say it with me, church. With everyone. Everyone. So if God's desire then is for us to live at peace, to experience peace, and for peace to rule our heart and our head, what is the problem? Let me tell you a story. A long time ago, there were two brothers. And these two brothers shared adjoining farms. And for over 40 years, they worked side by side with one another, sharing equipment, helping each other out whenever needed. And then one day, a rift developed. Anybody in this room ever have a rift with a friend? Anybody in this room ever have a rift with a family member? Anybody ever have a rift with your spouse? There's some liars in this room. Y'all, I'll tell you what, man. I can't just shut up and look around That's like right. else is what's going That's on. right. Rifts happen. Say that with me. Rifts happen. Rifts happen. If you're human, you're going to have a rift, okay? You're going to have a rift. Rifts develop. And what happens is they begin small, but then they grow larger if you don't work it out. What happened was, between these two brothers, it grew into a major difference to finally that it exploded into an exchange of bitter words followed by months of angry silence. They stopped talking to each other. I'm hoping my mom doesn't watch this one. Back when I was in seminary, a rift happened between me and my mom. It started off small. It started to develop because we couldn't work it out. It grew a little bit longer. And then for really six months to eight months, we didn't talk to each other. Silence in the relationship. Now, praise God, we worked through it. And there was reconciliation. But I get the story when rifts happen, all right? So here's what happens. One day, the eldest brother, Pete, was out in his fields when a fella in a Jeep pulled up. The man jumped out of the Jeep, and he approached Pete, and he was carrying a carpenter's toolbox. And he said to Pete, look, Pete, I'm looking for a few days' worth of work. Do you have anything for me? Perhaps you have a few small jobs that I could do for you. Well, yes, I do, said Peter. See the creek down there? It's the border between my farm and my brother's farm. My brother keeps the creek up high and deep to keep me from stepping even one foot onto his beloved farm. Well, I'll oblige him every day. I want you to take the timber that's over here by the barn and I want you to go over to the creek and I want you to build a tall 
beautiful fence. So I don't even have to look at my brother's land anymore. I don't have to look at my brother's barns. I don't have to look and see my brother out working his field. You do that because I don't want nothing to do with that stinking brother of mine anymore. And so the carpenter looked at him, Pete, and said, I'll be glad to. I'll be glad to. No worries, brother. I understand. Just point me to the post hole digger and I'll get the job done. What is the problem? Go to James chapter 3. Open your Bibles. Let's go to James chapter 3 and let's get into the Word. Here we go. All right? James chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 16, okay? Go to James chapter 3, verse 16. And listen, if you have ever had a conflict with another person, you're going to want to tune into this today because James has some very important things to say to us, okay? Here we go. James chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 16. Here we go. Ready? For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist. All right? And if you got your Bibles, underline those words, jealousy and selfish ambition. Here we go. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be what? Disorder in every vile practice. That's James 3, verse 16. Now, jump over to chapter 4, verse 1. Just a few verses down. What causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? Why do you get angry? Why do you start to argue? Why do you get upset with another person? Is not this that your passions are at war within you? So look at what James described. He says this. First of all, there be disorder. Right? Disorder sounds a lot like the opposite of what? Say it with me. It's the opposite of what? Peace. Right? Order. But order is peace. Right? So if you want, if you're at peace, you've got order. If you're not at peace, you've got what? Disorder. Okay? Quarrels and fights. That doesn't sound like people are at what? Peace with one another, do they? That's the opposite of being at peace with one another. Now, where do these things come from? Where does disorder come from? Right? It's rooted in jealousy and selfish ambition. These are two prominent things that destroy community. My jealousy, my selfish ambition can all be summed up in this. I want what I want. That's jealousy and selfish ambition. Jealousy and selfish ambition says this. I want what I want. Okay? And I'm going to get what I want to get. And I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's what creates this. Okay? And if you look back in James chapter 3, verse 14, what does he say? Jealousy and selfish ambition flow from where? They flow from where, church? They flow from your heart. Now, wait a minute. God says, what does he want you to rule you? He wants peace to rule your what? Your mind and your heart. Peace can't rule your mind and your heart if jealousy and selfish ambition are flowing from that heart, right? That's why you're getting angry. That's why you're picking a fight. That's why you're arguing with your spouse. That's why you're yelling at your kids. That's what's running amok with your coworkers and people at school, right? He says this, the root of quarrels, the roots of fight is our passions. And our passions cause a war inside of us. What's the opposite of peace? War. What causes war? Your passions that fuel your jealousy, that unite your selfish ambition, that eliminate the peace that God wants to give you. And so what's the impact of not being at peace inside? Let's look at There's two of them, okay? Number one. First, there's going to be an impact with other people. Notice this. James chapter 4, verse 2. Put your finger on it. Here we go. Ready? James chapter 4, verse 2. What does he say? You desire and you do not have, so you what? Murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. Now I'm going to ask a really hard question right now. How many of you have ever killed a friendship out of anger? How many of you have ever killed a friendship out of anger? How many of you have ever killed a relationship with a family member out of anger? 
How many of you killed a marriage out of anger? We kill relationships. Jesus said this, when you have anger in your heart, you've committed what? Murder. So James just takes that and says, look, you fight, you do all these things, right? You desire, you don't have. So what you're doing is you are murdering your friendships. Your quarrels, your fights, they're killing your relationship with your spouse and your children and your grandchildren, right? To the point that that relationship dies. How much damage have you done to a friendship? Now, this is going to be rough, right? How much damage have you done to a friendship because you just didn't get what you wanted? How much damage did you do to a marriage because you didn't get what you wanted? How much damage did you do to the people at work because you didn't get what you wanted? How much damage did you do to the people you go to church with because you didn't get what you wanted? Right? First, we have to recognize what we do to others when we're not at peace. Then it's God. Watch this. James 4, verse 3 and 4. Let's look at it together. Put your finger on it. You do not have because you don't ask. You ask, but you don't receive. Why? Because you ask wrongly. And you spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? See, when our heart is being pulled by selfishness, I want what I want, right? With jealousy, you have something, I want it. What happens is, first of all, it messes up our relationship with God so that our prayers are all out of whack. And then you wonder, why are our prayers not getting answered? Well, it's because you're praying. You're either not praying for the right things or you're praying for the wrong things with the wrong desires. Instead of praying to God, listen, God, I need peace in this relationship. I need reconciliation in this relationship. I need healing in this relationship. I need you, God, I need you to help me get along with my siblings. God, I need you to help me have a better relationship with my parents. God, I need you to fix my marriage. God, I need you to restore this friendship. God, I need you to make me a better employee to my boss. Or I need a boss to be, I want to be a boss who's a better boss to my employees. Whatever the relationship dynamic is, right? I have to pray this. God, help me be a better pastor and have better relationships with the people that I serve, right? See, that's the prayer that God wants. But here's our prayers, right? And you know what they are, right? God, just cut that dude's tongue out. <laughs> I have to admit, earlier this, a couple days ago, something happened on our, our What's Happening in Gardendale page. And I, I swear, I wanted to say, God, just blow up all those computers of all those negative haters, right? Okay? So, so if you want to know what all that's about, I'll tell you later, okay? But anyway, right? See, we have these wrong prayers, right? God, cut their tongue out. God, God, I mean, like, God, can you just make them run off the side of the road? Right? Not too much damage, but just enough, right? Okay. God, can you make them move, right? <laughs> right? Um, God, can they just catch a third world disease, okay? You know, nothing too bad, right? But to keep them out of commission, right? See, we have these prayers that are driven by the wrong motivations, and therefore they don't get answered. Now James, what he does, is he lays it out there that when we are in this mindset, we have become an adulterous people. He says, when this is where we are, with our heart, and with our mind, and with our prayers, in this broken relationship with people, in this broken relationship with God, we have become an adulterous people. So here's the question. Who are you having an affair with today? See, if you're an adulterous people, what does that mean? It means that you're having an affair with someone or something. And what James says is your affair, your love affair, is with the world. It's a love affair with the world. You've tried to have your cake and your ice cream too. It's a love affair with the world, right? And watch what happens. He says, listen, you're an adulterous people. You're having an affair with the world. And James makes it clear that when you try to have a friendship with the world, right? Here's what, a, let me just give you a definition. Friendship with the world says this. How do you know you have a friendship with the world, okay? That then makes you an adulterous people. When your mindset is, I'm going to get what I want and how I want it, that's friendship with the world. 
When your mindset is, I'm going to do what I want to do regardless, that's friendship with the world. When you have this mindset, what I care more about what other people think than what God thinks, that's a friendship with the world. When you think this is, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do everything I can to make my desires, my dreams come true, regardless of what God wants, that's friendship with the world. Friendship with the world ignores God or puts him in the back seat, okay? That's what friendship with the world does. And so when we have a friendship with the world, here's what the Bible says, you'll be at enmity with God. Now listen, I didn't know what the word enmity means. So Elizabeth texted me to me in the middle of service, right? But I don't have my phone with me, so I can't read off the definition, right? But I think if I remember the definition that she sent me, like in the middle of church service, right? It said this, enmity is to be in direct opposition to somebody else. So see, when I'm a friend of the world, that means my life now is in direct opposition to who? To God. And if I'm in opposition to God, I can't be at what? Peace with God, right? You see how that works? You cannot be at peace if you find yourself in enmity. Now, let me give you some examples from today's culture of enmity. You know you have enmity towards another person when you defriend them on social media. <laughs> you know you have enmity when you block somebody's number on your phone. Okay? You definitely know you have enmity if you have to put out a restraining order. That's probably enmity, right? <laughs> or safety, a little bit of both, right? Okay? <laughs> you know you have enmity when all you can think is you hope they go to hell. Right? And uh, look, we're, all, we're adults here, right? Well, I know there's a few kids in the room. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but teens, y'all know this. There's people at your school that you would wish to go to hell. That's enmity. Adults. You, you know it, right? We all have people in our lives that as much as we don't want to think it or feel it, God. Now, I had a good friend said this. Instead of thanking people to go to hell, instead, the way to kind of get the enmity out of your heart but still be somewhat, you know, vindicated is just go on to be with Jesus sooner than later, okay? <laughs> All right, so that's enmity, right? Enmity is the opposite of what? Say it with me, church. Peace. Enmity is the opposite of what, church? Peace. In fact, if you looked at the end of James chapter 4, go ahead and put your finger on it. James 4, verse 4. Let's look at it together. What does it say? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world... That means you're driven by selfish ambition, jealousy. They're ruling your heart. You're doing what you want to do, right? You make yourself a what? An enemy of God. And I think if we can all agree as church for one moment, if I'm an enemy of God, I'm definitely not at what? Peace with God. If I'm an enemy with God, I'm not at peace with God. So what now? What do I do now if that's where I'm at? Let me tell you the second half of the story. So this carpenter, he went about continuing to work. And meanwhile... Father, Farmer Pete decided to go to the cattle auction in town. So he left for the entire day. He was out of pocket all day. When he returned home he, at sunset, he was shocked to see what the carpenter had done. There was no fence. Instead, the carpenter had built a bridge over the creek. He built this beautiful bridge so that he could walk across it. And there on the other side of the bridge was his brother, his younger brother. And he came across the bridge, he met Pete in the middle of the bridge, hands open, arms open, he looked at his brother and said, Pete, after everything I've done to you over the past few weeks, I can't believe you still reach out to me. You're right, Pete, it's time to bury the hatchet. And so the two brothers that met, they gave each other a big bear hug. They turned to the carpenter and they said, thank you. The carpenter had his box of tools up on his shoulder. He's about to leave. And Pete looked at him and said, hey, don't go yet. Don't go yet. We got more work for you to do. And the carpenter looked at him and said, boys, as much as I want to stay, I've got other bridges 
to build. I've got other bridges to build. See, God knows left to ourselves, we're going to build what, church? Fences. We're not going to build bridges. That's not our personality. That's not how we're driven. Left to ourselves without Jesus, we're going to build fences all day long to the point that we're alone. But Jesus says, I'm not in the business of building fences. I'm in the business of building bridges. And so what Christ does for us is he makes the first move. God instead gets to work building a bridge. He comes to us. He makes the first move. And that's what grace is all about. That's why in the book of Romans he says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That while we were still enemies and driven by the friendships of the world and selfish ambition and jealousy, we are reconciled to God. See, you can't have peace if you don't have reconciliation. If you don't have reconciliation, you simply have neutrality. If you don't have reconciliation, you're simply ambivalent. True peace comes through the process of reconciliation. First with God, then with others. Reconciliation is the process by which God repairs and restores a relationship by the gift of forgiveness. Reconciliation is driven by forgiveness. God forgives you of your selfish ambition. God forgives you of every time you're jealous. God forgives you of every time that your heart is set on doing what you want, when you want, how you want it, and by whatever means you're going to obtain it. God forgives you of you. And He forgives you of all your sins. He no longer counts them against you. He wipes the slate clean. And when the slate is clean, we have what, church? Peace. I got peace with God, right? I'm, I'm, everything is okay between the two of us. All because Jesus built a bridge, came to me, took away everything that was wrong, and now we are okay. And it's fully by the grace of God through the action of Jesus. Let me describe it this way. How many of you have ever found rotten fruit in your house? How many of you have ever seen a rotten banana? What does a rotten banana look like? Brown. Uh, brown, but if it gets really rotten, what is it? Black, okay? So I want you just to imagine for a moment, this is what you are. You are a rotten banana, okay? You are squishy and messy. You are on the, both externally and internally just a mess, right? There's nothing redeeming about you. You are black all the way through, right? So what does Christ do? He comes and he takes the rotten banana and he gives it, he just removes it. And then he makes you into a fresh new banana that even Curious George would like, okay? So I'm bananas, you're bananas, we're bananas. <laughs> That's the church. Church full of bananas, right? <laughs> That's what we are. We go from being rotten fruit to beautiful, good fruit, right? Now, how does that translate to today? I want to say one thing before I leave you with this thought. First of all, the book of Romans says this. If at all possible, we should through every effort, live at peace with one another. As much as it depends on me, live at peace with one another. I want to acknowledge just for a moment, because some of you may be hearing this message and you need to hear this right now. I want to acknowledge that there are certain relationships that you will not be able to reestablish peacefully. Okay? I think there's three of them. Number one, if you are in an abusive relationship, physical, emotional, spiritual, verbal. The likelihood of being able to reestablish peace with that person will only happen by the grace of God working in the other person's life to change them so that you can reconnect. That's number one. Number two, unwilling relationships. 
You may have a full desire to be at peace with another person, but if that person is unwilling, right, you have to wait until God changes their spiritual condition so that they are willing. And then number three, betrayal. This often happens with affairs. This often happens in financial situations where there's betrayal of money and trust. Um, this can happen in families, right? Sometimes betrayal is very hard to overcome. And again, it's only by the grace of God, right? But that doesn't mean we just ignore what Romans says. Romans says to live what? Peaceably, peaceably with all to the best of our ability, if possible, right? So how can you have peace? Let me give you a peace plan to close with. It's real simple. Number one, Get real. Get real. If you have a broken relationship today, just can you acknowledge that? Okay? Part of healing is just acknowledging my marriage is not at peace. These friendships are not at peace. My relationship with my kid or my grandkid is not at peace. My relationship with my parent or my grandparents is not at peace. My relationship with this coworker or this church member or this friend is not at peace. Let's get real and just acknowledge where peace is broken. Number two, pray boldly. Pray boldly that God will give you the fruit of peace in your life the fruit of peace in that person's life so that there's a common ground that you can come together that my peace with God, their peace with God, that will now translate into a peace with one another. Number three, and this is the hardest one. Take the first step. Stop waiting for someone to come to you. Stop waiting for that person to get it together. Stop waiting for that person to be the first to acknowledge. You, in the courage that God gives you, with the peace of God that follows you, take the first step, church. Number four. As you take the first step, own your part. Jesus makes this so clear. He says, look, when you go to another person, you take the log out of your eye before you take the speck out of somebody else's. You own your part. You own your attitude. You own your actions. You own your words. You own your own uh, frustrations. You own your own part in this conflict. There's always two sides to everything. Just own it. Number five, ask for forgiveness. Don't make excuses. Don't offer explanations. Don't say, well, I did this, but just stop it. Own it and then say these words. Please forgive me. Y'all try that with me. Ready? Please forgive me. One more time. The most important words we'll ever say in our life. Please forgive me. And then receive it. And then once you've done that, then flip it around. Let that person do what you just did for them. Let them take ownership. Let them ask for forgiveness. And then bring it together. Bring it together like the brothers. Bring it together like Haley and I. Bring it together so that you can be at peace with one another. Let's pray. Lord, I know that peace is hard, right? And sometimes we ignore what's right in front of us and sometimes we don't want to engage in it and sometimes we don't want to it, sometimes it just makes us uncomfortable and we don't know what to do with it and so my prayer is that you'll just you'll just inspire us today through the power of the presence of the Holy Ghost to step into whatever needs to step in and my prayer is that you'll give some people in this room or people in our community the courage to take the first step just take the first step move into it and as we take that first step let's take ownership of whatever is wrong whatever we've done whatever we said whatever we didn't say whatever hurt we've experienced whatever hurt we've generated we just take ownership for it and we ask for forgiveness and we receive it from one another so that we can be at peace 
as God's people. That we can live at peace and that you can move the needle so we're not ones and twos or maybe just right in the middle threes, but that we're truly living the fours and the fives of the peace that passes all understanding, which is Jesus. And we all said together, Amen.